Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, have you all been to Galatea? Is first time for no. first time? <laughs> oh, okay. Any first timers? Welcome. So my name is Claudia Fix. I'm very, very happy to be here. I am the newly appointed, very recent uh, gallery director. So thank you for having me. Uh, I've known this gallery and most of the members for a long time. I respect, uh, I love all of the artists, uh, members here. I love their work, their commitment, you know, being here on a Sunday afternoon, trying to revitalize the art scene in Boston. This is exactly what we need. This is ex exactly what I do. I'm an arts administrator. I work for you. If you don't succeed, I don't succeed also, so I'm very happy to share this afternoon with you. We have our three artists here from uh, exhibiting during the month of October. Galatea has different artists every month, but we can talk more about it. Maybe uh, one of our board members can explain how it works at the end. And today's uh, program, uh, it's going to be an interaction between the three artists and we're going to move together from one gallery to the other and each artist prepared a special tour of their own exhibition and we have here, we're going to start here with Claire and Paul Gwizdowski. Good. <laughs> My God. <laughs> I've practiced this for the whole entire week. So Paul wrote, a, a, made a composition for Claire in your honor. And thank you for sharing with us. So we're going to start here with Claire. We move on to Yvonne's and we move on to the end. And please stay with us ask questions, we're going to interact. This is an engaging exhibition and there is a lot to uncover, uncover and a lot to learn from all of you. So we'll start here. Thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'd like to start my portion with an introduction from Paul. Um, and since just like uh, Christine's theme of couples, Paul is my partner. We are a couple. In fact, the name of this show came about, um, basically, we, we worked, it, it was, we kind of came up with the name together. So Paul's going to do a brief introduction. Thank you. This is uh, Spanish Dances in Blue for Claire. Uh, but, you know, uh, all of the beautiful artwork here today, and you know the artists, uh, they are all being able to be part of this uh, celebration. And uh, it's a privilege to you know, sit here, and you know, it's a, a garden in all that is Claire's work. And uh, Isaac, Isaac Asimov might have said, uh, life support in orbit. And so uh, that it remains a garden, that's, uh, that's our challenge. Spanish dances in blue. Yeah.
Thank you, Paul. Um, I love that composition, just beautiful. Um, I'm going to start my talk with the title of the show, which is called A Garden in Orbit, which is, you know, kind of an unusual title. Uh, we came up with that, actually, when it comes to titles, usually Paul and I uh, work it out ourselves, because I have titles that Paul usually says, oh, that's terrible. And, then, <laughs> and he comes up with titles, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Well, Paul is a poet, so he certainly is better with words than I am. Um, but I'm going to... So I, I will start with these two paintings, which are called, they're both a garden in orbit. Um, they're really new. And the reason I, well, the orbit part comes from the fact that I use a lot of circles. Our Earth is round, in spite of some flat order. <laughs> um, and it orbits around the sun in a galaxy. So to me, the circles make me think of kind of orbits and galaxies. These colors are unusual for me. So more typical colors are like this. So more towards the blues, cooler colors, just a very different feeling, and maybe a little more have a sense of the sky and space. But about a year ago, I started playing with these colors, and it was really unusual for me. It's like, why all these weird pinks and be beiges and yellows and blues? Um, and I don't know exactly why, but it made me think of a garden. And I guess one way of looking at them is that our earth certainly supports gardens. It could be a beautiful garden. It isn't always, but sometimes it is. So that's where the title of the show comes about. Um, so this would be a more typical color. And one of the things I love is I like to work very spontaneously. I do actually do a lot of pouring, though recent work, it's maybe not as, not as obvious. For example, I think right here you can see that splash of paint sometimes. So I will pour, and then sometimes I'll take a brush and smooth it out. Um, basically, I see myself as a painter. You know, I like to play with form, but I love paint. Uh, recently, a lot of people are doing all kinds of very, very interesting things with very innovative material, but I like paint. Um, but I, at the same time, I didn't want to stay. I felt that the rectangular format of the canvas is a little limiting. It's, to me, it's confining. Um, circles are much, have more of a flow to them. You could also, circles are a universal symbol of, well, actually of unity, <laughs> almost in every culture. They are often associated with women, circular forms versus rectangular forms, or, you know, kind of. So all those things come into play with my work. Um, but besides, so I love being spontaneous, but there's a part of me that wants things organized. And when you're an abstract painter, it's like, it's hard to organize <laughs> gestural marks. You know, you don't have the observable world to kind of organize it. Um, so I thought, let's, let's see what happens if we create some geometric shapes, and my geometric shapes are very simple, that, you know, kind of obvious. So I do start with a rectangle, which I will divide from the top, divide vertically, divide horizontally, and two diagonal lines, and then just using a compass, I will draw circles, and they kind of overlap. And 
which creates the, and it's one piece, the really only one that's collaged is this one. Um, so that one, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I might play with that a little bit more, but they're not collaged. It's one piece because I also like illusion. One of the um, advantages of painting is, well, paint, you know, some modernist artists say paint has to be paint, has to be true to materials, but paint can beautifully create illusions, and that's one of its strengths. So I, these are not figurative, there's no images, but yes, there's a delusion of space, and that's what interests me. Um, so, so kind of, and I have two sides to this. We have like warm kind of, maybe like a sunrise kind of colors. Um, and the, but moving over to this side, which is all kind of blue with a touch of gray, maybe a little moody. So it's another side and I'm hoping that the paintings in between kind of connect the two sides. Um, these also start with a circle. They go back to an older series, but they're super new. I think I finished that one in maybe August, September. Um, so they start out a circle, and the one over there is the first one, and I was trying to make the biggest circle I could. Um, now the difference between this and let's say this is they're all circles and they're divided into geometric forms, but I open up the top because, and I'm kind of a, since I pour paint and paint wet and wet, yeah, it's kind of, it, 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 I hope it has a nice flow, but it can be, I, I like the kind of splotches, I'm happy with them. And I said, well, all right, let them happen, why not? Uh, over here, I, and close things, and I, I think that's good because it adds a contrast to the spontaneous center, but you're like, okay, what happens if we open it up? Which is what I did on that one, and the reason it's two pieces is, well, I just wanted to make it as big as I could. I think next time I will make it a little bigger. Um, but so these started as smaller blue circles but I, since there are two sheets of paper, it's like, what happens if we open it up? What if we don't have the two sides of the circle connecting? And well, yes, it does look like wings. And I thought it was interesting. Um, I, I thought it was dynamic. And by the way, we did that with Paul too. I think the first one, <laughs> we were in my studio and like, oh, let's see what happens if we open it up which we did, and um, so this is a new direction. I will probably explore it further in the, in the future. So Claire, that's a, that's a good segment because I was just to Thank ask you, you um, is this all new work? Yes, all, most of it is new work. The one right behind you, and that is the only one that is not a circle, is a little bit older, uh, but it, it's very special to me. The title is, <coughs> Um, Zoli's Blues, and Zoli is my father. His name was Zoltan, we called him Zoli. Um, and I don't know why this painting made me think of him. It just did, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Uh, he was kind well, When I first yes. saw your work, it did uh, remind me of the Picasso blue and Okay. Stage. I, was I love those. Is, Thank you. I was wondering if it, it was intentional that you progressed from the pinkish to the blue. Um, no, not intentional. But I love, you know, but I'm flattered by the comparison. Uh, not intentional. I'm, I have taught color theory classes. But my own paintings are very intuitive. For me, color is all about feelings, all about emotion, and it's totally intuitive. It's the way I feel at the moment. And sometimes I feel blue, <laughs> and sometimes I want warm colors. So, yes. I have one more comment, and then we can open okay. questions or comments. Can you tell us a little bit about the process 
uh, including the panel? Yes. Um, okay. So I think I first did a few watercolors, and then I said, oh, what if we make it big? Because, And what if instead of having it on a rectangular form, what if we totally take it off and just... Um, and now, they do have a wooden panel behind them, and I have somebody cut those for me. I tried doing it myself. It was not a success. Paul and I tried doing it ourselves. It was not a big success. So there's a framing company, actually Felton Street Framers in Waltham, <laughs> and they will cut those wooden panels for me. And you, you covered yourself? I do hand. stretch it myself, yes. And that's the easy part. <laughs> but um, this one, I started with unstretched canvas. So canvas on the floor, and I had the shapes. And then I made a template. And um, then I stretched it on a template. But one of the things that happens when you work with acrylic, with paint, on unstretched on primed canvas is that it will shrink in weird ways, which is why that is 42 by 44. It was supposed to be 44 by 44, but it sort of shrunk that way. So now this one, I actually had a couple of them this size, and rather than stretching it after the fact, I, I stretched it first. And in some ways, I think it's, I, I'm happy. It's, it's, I'm happy with it. The only problem is that, you know, having the, not every, having those kind of panels done in advance is, you know, it's just takes up more space and, but yes. And again, they're done very similar to the watercolors. So I draw out the circles, I paint each. I, uh, my art teachers uh, from the past are like looking at me, like you're not supposed to do that. But I, <laughs> I paint each circle one at a time rather than paint the whole canvas all at once, which is what I was taught to do. Um, but that's what gives it the crisp edge and the transparency. And so, yeah, so I do paint one circle at a time, overlapping. They look collage, but they're not. This one is collage, and this one I just cut out a whole bunch of circles, and I was working very fast and really pouring paint, um, and then kind of uh, kind of combined the circles, which was, which was a different way of working, and I really enjoyed it, and I love the texture of that one. So well, I, I personally, I do love the movement that you bring, Thank and you. then if you start looking at the work from from here, you you are kind of like being pushed. It's almost like everything is rolling you over, and you're walking through. And then when you get here, it's exactly what you said. Mm. I almost feel like I want to take it and start playing yes. and, and make it into a, a fun. Exactly, uh, and it could do, and it could go. So this, what these are just the last couple of months, and who knows what will happen in a year. Yeah, so, transition. anyone, um, any comments, any questions? Just another, I'm sorry. Yes. Comment was about the title. Um, it was interesting to me that you talked about the earth and the circles and the cultures. And, however, when I looked at it first and saw the title, I thought that kind of, you know, when you talk about your relationship, that's what I sensed, you know, more of a personal orbit or kind of being with another person or people. And so there's a lot of movement that, um, so for me, it actually responds to also a more personal level of your relationship and how it's a garden and it's growing, you know, and you have to nurture it and sometimes ones, you know, need more. Mm -hmm. But also just the various circles, how they move and make sense and move around each other. It's almost like it could be two circles and just see the orbit, or you know, it could be multiple mm -hmm. coming in or sort of breaking apart. So, anyway, so it's just interesting. Okay, well, Christine and thank Claire, you. Did you guys talk about?
No, amazing. <laughs> but it's amazing, right? It's an action, really. <laughs> Very interesting. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I've always been curious about how you make the circle so large, because you were saying you can use a compass. Yes. And I can understand with the smaller ones, but the large ones... Okay, I have a large wooden, old-fashioned wooden compass about this big that was used to draw circles on blackboards. <laughs> and I love that compass because it's so hard to replace, except I took the chalk out and added a short pencil. <laughs> so, yes. What did you say it was used for? They used to draw circles on blackboards. Blackboard days, when <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> so yes, so that, yeah, so it is a compass of sorts. Not with your. Well, maybe <laughs> next time. Well, that's tempting. Right. Maybe next time. <laughs> yes. Should we move on? Move yes. On? Thank you. That was Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. These particular paintings are a reflection or a response to my daily walk um, around uh, the wetlands in Quincy, Mass. A lot of people don't know where Quincy, Massachusetts is, but if you're coming down the expressway, you will see that right next is Quincy. And um, I wasn't that familiar with Quincy either until I worked at South Boston Art, uh, South Boston High School as an art teacher. And um, while I was there, people kind of made me gravitate south. And uh, we moved here. And we moved here because we see the ocean every day and we live in wetlands. Living in wetlands, I didn't realize the cost of living in wetlands, the insurance. But it also made me realize how vulnerable we are because during the storms it's uh, critical that we preserve our, our wetlands so we don't float away. But um, every day I walk with my dog, Luna, <laughs> and, and um, what is amazing is every day the changes uh, in the environment because as the sea comes and goes and the, the Tides change, the colors every day are different and amazing, and the shapes are incredible. So uh, there's a, a multitude of things to paint. And so I started probably more than a year ago making these paintings. I started with that red one for some reason. It must have been uh, Deep Autumn. And um, my interest was in bringing people to see the, the riches of the colors as they change, as the tides come in and out, and um, as winter comes. You could paint a million paintings because every day is different. And um, after I hung this show, I said, I'm going to take a break. But every time I go for a walk, I see something different. So I'm like, I'm like compelled to make these paintings. And um, also concerned because uh, of our environmental concerns and our government doesn't want to put money into preserving wetlands, so we may all float away, or some of us will, but it doesn't matter which neighborhood you're from, it seems to be affecting everywhere, um, the floods, the destruction, and I won't even get into any more political things because we'll all go crazy, but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, that's what I do. Like, I'll go on a walk, I'll find shapes and colors that intrigue me. I'll take, a, sometimes I paint outside. My home is on a wetland. In fact, these paintings come directly from my backyard. And I've made uh, kind of borders of flowers because the Phragmites come into the yard. Most of it doesn't belong to us, but we got this little house because um, the wetlands are behind it. And um, 
So that's what I do. I just look at the colors and then I, some things just stick with me and um, I'm, I'm compelled to paint that. <laughs> so um, the sea, you can tell from the seasons. Last winter was very unique because um, it would snow and melt within hours. So you had to kind of really figure what was happening. And things changed so radically during the time of the day and um, the seasons and the tides. So uh, that's what I kind of like to capture. And I'm looking around and um, so these blue paintings, you know, the, it fluctuates because we live right across from Route 3A, um, Quincy Shore Drive. So sometimes, uh, you know, during a storm, I don't have any of my storm paintings, but you can see, the, I mean, the waters basically come over the wall and it's very eerie and strange. And um, I think that's going to be my next set of paintings because um, I think we all need to really recognize that this is all happening. I think we all know what's happening, most of us or some of us. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is um, because we're all so settled in our own neighborhoods, and I wasn't a Quincy person. I raised my family in Cambridge. And when I moved to Quincy, because of my, the proximity to where we were working at South Boston High School, um, it kind of changed my perspective some. But um, as I go on this walk, and it literally looks like that, there's also in my neighborhood um, this little pond um, where the aigrettes come to roost. And I, I made some paintings of the aigrettes and the pond also, which most people would miss because you don't come to Quincy, Mass. But the um, aigrettes come every spring, and then by the end of uh, the summer, they fill three trees, and it's always been so amazing to me that they come to this little neighborhood, and they come every year, and as the seasons change, they fill th three trees. And um, I always thought how, I didn't ever think I would paint them because they're so amazing, but we went on a trip to Quebec, and um, I saw this great, uh, mural from Rio Pell, who was the lover of um, Joan Mitchell. And it was amazing because he, he painted, uh, he had a lot of white birds that he made from stencils. So I thought, well, if he can do it, I could try it. So I coaxed my husband into helping me uh, photograph the aigrettes as they were coming into land, and then we, I adjusted the shapes and colors and I made stencils because their shapes were so hard to, to get. So um, that painting and the one behind is from this amazing pond, and um, that's the story. So I'm gonna pass it to my husband's niece, Lorene, who is a poet, and um, she will talk. Um, that was great, Yvonne. And uh, so first I want to just thank Yvonne for inviting me to be here today. It's such an honor to be a part of her exhibition in some way. So thank you. Uh, the other thing is Yvonne and I have always had a lot in common when it comes to my poetry and her art. One of the things that I love about her art is that she looks to nature to capture those fleeting moments of color and light 
And I try to do the same thing with nature in my poems, not always as successfully. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that that external landscape that Yvonne is always trying to capture, you're also capturing your own internal landscape and your own shifting moods, which is a very cool thing. And if you've ever been to Yvonne's house, you know that this is a very small uh, portion of the external landscape of the marsh that she's captured. And it's also a very small portion of the internal moods that she's captured. So when she asked me to pick some poems, uh, I, you know, I looked at the first uh, title, of the painting, the marsh is confused and the earth is confused and so am I. And I went, yes, I have something about that. I, I am confused and I have poems about that. So it was actually uh, fairly easy to, to pick poems that correlate. So I'm just gonna uh, read a few and then I'm gonna finish off with one uh, from one of my books that, that isn't in the packet. Okay, so First one uh, is Armageddon Blues, and another thing that we had never talked about, but so it was interesting to hear your talk, is that uh, need to capture nature and the beauty of it, but also this sort of anxiety about its fading and what's happening with climate change in the earth right now. So some of my poems have that in them. All right, uh, High Tide, and um, this is about the painting over there. All right. I'm walking along a curve of world where the sea ends. The sun is white and round, tame as the moon at dawn. If I want to, I can look straight at it. In place of geese in formation, smoke rides the current from Canada, shadow that builds then crests to darkness tumbling across sky in colorless beats, surreal pentameters. I pass a pair of women speed walking to nowhere in particular, give a nod to routine. A dog surges ahead, chases a seagull. Um, so this is the second one, and this is The Magician's Apprentice. And it's also about this idea of, uh, you know, yes, we're looking at this beauty, but is, any, is it illusion, like we heard in the first talk? Is it real? Uh, Magician's Apprentice. Even sky wasn't enough, not a day's blue backdrop, not snow falling out of nowhere, settling onto the sleep of trees, orchards, melting on my tongue. At night, when I closed my eyes, rows of twisted forms reached, put out their arms, each fanned branch, a silhouette of the ugliness inside. When spring came with its veils and its petals of lights, the past that had hardened into landscape flickered to green flame. In my hand, a bouquet of all the unnamed colors that might be illusion, might be real. Okay, um, <laughs> this is, I'm gonna read this, this last one and then I'm gonna shift to the book. Um, this is called Solstice and this is written uh, you know, in that period where everything is melting, everything is thawing, but then it's, it's freezing back up into ice again. Uh, surface solstice. Surface so clear I could open the water and swim inside the silence. All winter I skated on ice's mirror. Beneath me my blades sparked ghostly fire as the world blurred by, its moments frozen in glacial time. Even children and small dogs turn to statues. Now light burns a new language onto blue and leaves whisper lost passwords. I trace my fingertips over a painting of time and watch life ripple in ever widening circles. We will be all right. Okay, <laughs> wait, so, <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, so the last one I'm going to read, this is actually, I'm dedicating this to Yvonne. Um, and this is uh, called Monet at Honfleur. Uh, Honfleur? You, you guys are artists, how do you say it? Honfleur. Okay, Monet at Honfleur, uh, 1868. 
Uh, and this is, it's just about uh, his process and how uh, whatever the weather, he would go out alone painting while everybody else was living their lives. And just that incredible dedication to capturing those moments of beauties, which everybody here does. Um, okay, Manet Hanfleur, Hanfleur, 1868. I'm gonna put on my glasses for this one. After days of storm, the village slept late and rose into a stillness wrapped in silence and light. Early morning, everyone inside drinking coffee or writing letters, warming over late night conversations by fires, blazing counterpoint to a world singing cold harmony. You stood apart in a landscape blinding with possibility, nearly frozen in three coats. Your figure, figure only a daub of black darkening the field's blank canvas. What would it have looked like if you had painted yourself into that scene, unfolding its origami shadows for you? Not the coat, the foot warmer, the easel, or even the strokes of the brush filling in the crescendos and diminuendos of nature and all its incantations. No, it's the signature of your form I want. It's the witchcraft of your mind, forever chasing instantaneity, the image always out of reach, disappearing over time's steep rise, then stopping to wait in a hollow of seconds just long enough for vision to reach the next crest of horizon and plunge on after the dazzling. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, do you want to take questions or? Sure, we'll have questions. Do you want, you have it. Do you want to come back up? <laughs> <laughs> they might have questions for you. Yes, Claudine. Um, I have a question. This beautiful thing to show, um, and this is probably a, a painter's question: Is um, why do you choose to paint on wood? On wood, right? Am I correct? Right. Rather than canvas, is there a reason it's tied? Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, I like the wood because I feel like it holds the color better, and I find um, canvas sometimes distracting because of uh, the texture. So I think it's easier to just um, have the color be uh, the most important thing. Yeah, for me it works. I mean, everybody's different, so yeah. But you have to be careful of the boards too. Every, everything has its you know, issues. But um, yeah, I like this, the solid nature of uh, painting on the boards. Have you ever uh, always no, canvas. and I'll use canvas when I, you know, was first starting to paint, but. I have questions. You know, I'm not a painter, but now that you said you paint, would you prep the wood first or do you paint directly right onto the wood? Well, the, um, the boards I buy are already primed with gesso. There, yeah. And um, some I have, I have some wooden boards that, you know, you have to gesso and gesso a few times, but. Um, I would only, I've learned a certain lesson, and that is buy the best boards, <laughs> because um, during uh, this past summer, I've had some issues with um, the less expensive boards, and not as um, with the humidity and having them, I will tell you, well, they will warp a bit, so, or sometimes. So I would go with the best quality, and I will go from now on with Luckily, my bigger paintings are mostly on, um, I don't want to give the brand names, but yeah, you really have to be careful what you get. So, you can edit, that's okay. Yeah, you can edit. <laughs> right. You I have was, other artists here working with candles, right? Yeah. Just off, off okay. You know what I'm going to say? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you specifically, but I was frustrated at the because it was just, and I, you know, asked the company how to fix it, and um, especially because I live in a wetland and it was such a moist summer, and I paint outside, 
uh, you know, um, uh, the moisture just, and the less expensive boards, I could see that the, it was affected by the moisture. But these are all mostly okay. <laughs> so Eva, do you photograph? I do. As you're walking? Yeah. Open, right, and right. And then you go back and then you... I go back several times. I go every day and then I just stick with... Um, um, often I just... I consider myself a plein air painter, but then when I started this series, um, it would just depend. You know, I would go out, I would paint, I would, uh, I, I felt I could get more of the image in my mind if I wasn't rushing because you, it changes so fast. Even in like one day, the light changes. So like these, I actually did in my backyard. But I can always use that as a reference because we, there's the Phragmites growing and um, so I'm always looking at the colors, but then I'll go back and you know, it just depends on the painting, but I used to more sit out, you know, for like three or four hours doing a painting and finishing it. But I feel now that um, I, I have something in my mind I want to achieve. So um, it's, I can be more careful if I'm um, just using some photographs and going to check on what I'm doing. Yes. Hope I don't get in trouble. Yeah. Um, can you tell us any paintings are um, related to climate chaos? Or, um, <laughs> I was going to ask yeah. if you think your art is political. So that's an interesting um, thing. <laughs> right. Well, some of my paintings that aren't here are more directly political because I'm very concerned. Um, I got very into this group. Uh, called Four River Residents Against the Compressor Station. And that is um, a fracked gas compressor station in Weymouth, which isn't far from where I live. I mean, I'm not right in the uh, heart of it, but it is bothering me a lot because those people in that neighborhood are at such risk. And also because the potential for an explosion there is very high. Um, I will just say our governor just, uh, when she was attorney general, just um, allowed uh, this Enbridge company, uh, not even an American company, to, to uh, she allowed the permits to happen. And um, you can see when you go over the bridge from Quincy to Weymouth and Hingham, you know, the, the toxic gases. And uh, recently in the news, um, well, it wasn't that far, there was a fire in Braintree. And um, it was just lucky that it didn't send a, send a response, uh, or uh, not a response, but that could have caused uh, fires, because it's all terrible industry there. So um, what is really bad is now they're saying that this company wants to uh, expand, and we're not hearing any, any uh, anything from our Massachusetts so-called progressive government that's saying we're not going to allow that to happen. And what, one reason I just put Quincy because, well, if you're at the Weymouth Compressor Station, you can see the Boston Harbor Islands. You can see the city of Boston. I'm not a scientist. A lot of the people from the Four River residents are, are, have done amazing studies. They know far more than um, the Department of Environmental Protection. My husband made a movie about it. Um, he documented the whole uh, uh, experience that these people went through to uh, not allow this compressor station in the middle of Boston waters so that you can see. I mean, people will come by in sailboats. People ride on the ferries every day. If there's ever an explosion, you know, 
which could easily happen because when that first uh, started uh, functioning, they had a lot of explosions. Um, not explosions, but uh, problems. Um, and no one's really doing anything about it. And now they're saying if something's already uh, in, uh, been built, Mari Healy's not going to, they're not, this government isn't going to do anything about it. So we're in a compression of natural gas? Yeah. And they've been releasing toxic gas without letting the public know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Globe finally picked up on it, but they had been releasing toxic gas since they opened. Right. And um, and if you go out there, you know, where this, you know, probably if you're going south from on Route 3A to the Cape or to Situate or uh, it's it's just a horrible thing, and the fact that they want to expand is horrible, and the fact that you know everyone, if you're asking me to be political, we have sort of a progressive, so-called uh, governor that is uh, aligning herself with big business as they all do, and you know this is what's happening. What country? You said that they're not even in America. Well, it's Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. yeah. And at, when um, they were building this thing, they were also saying that, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. They were saying that, oh, the electric companies and uh, were saying they don't need, was it the electric or gas company? Yeah, the electric. They didn't need any more of this to happen here because they were just playing, it was, the pipeline was going to Canada going through indigenous lands, and they were just going to sell their uh, gas abroad for profit. It's, it's no one in this uh, area was going to benefit from this. So. I just want to um, put a couple details. Yvonne um, hasn't mentioned yet that she took part in organizing several different art events that related to opposing that compressor station. So that's where the collaboration comes in, getting the community and children and people all around to, to create art about this compressor station and about climate change. So there's several different um, events that she actually did, played a big role in organizing where people would come either to the compressor station or downtown Quincy um, for a birthday and other, other events where art is really a collaboration between um, protesting against climate chaos, which plants like Enbridge have a huge part in planning and adding more and more toxins to the air, more and more to the carbon footprint. Yeah, and that's why I want it. Yeah, and actually, <laughs> you you need to see Robert's movie South Shore People Power because it documents the whole process. And I have to say that the people around Weymouth were brilliant and challenging um, this company. They, they just are smart and phenomenal and dedicated and still you don't get anywhere. So <laughs> it's this saying it's uh, just all of us need to know that we're not that far from any of this terrible, I mean, and here it is, Lemonster, I'm looking at, because that, you know, the flooding happened. You just don't know where the flooding, you would think, well, I know we're vulnerable to flooding, but you never know where it's going to happen. So we have to really respect and work with each other to get anywhere. So, so when you walk into this gallery, right, we're taken by the color, the beauty of it, right? We're, we transition from one environment to the other, and we experience this um, uh, convulsion of emotions when we see it, but then we get to this. So yeah. there are so many layers and layers and layers that you artists have the power and the voice to express. So thank yeah. you yeah. for enlightening right. us with yeah. all of those knowledge yeah. right. that, you know, most people don't know about. Right, and a lot of people in this gallery are part of Shared Habitat Earth, and so, um, along with other people, so we keep working. I remember that I came here once, I don't remember who the artist was, but there was also someone who lives in Concord. Remember that? 
but that she also painted uh, wetlands that were disappearing mm -hmm. in Concord, and uh, it would be interesting to continue this conversation yeah. and, and you know, move on to a different stage. But I also, following the, the coupling topic, <laughs> I, I love this uh, juxtaposition of mediums, the poetry, the movie making, the, uh, the, the statement, and of course the, the visual part. So I think this is actually the, 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 the true um, 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 component of the arts. You know, sometimes people think of galleries just being uh, static spaces that you go, you see the art, but there's so much more than just experiencing the art at that moment. So this is actually very um, interesting. Well, thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>I'm so glad to see everybody in there. And also out here, you can sit out here as well, whatever. You know, there's... You could go here or you could go there.
Okay, I guess everybody's settled into some spot. Um, I just wanted to start with, uh, I mean, we talked about the planet and uh, possible wetland disasters, and there's a lot going on in the world, and sometimes, and you know, what it's so wonderful is to be with other human beings and not on Zoom, and uh, to be with artists who are th thinking about what they're doing. So I thought to share this, which I learned recently from a, a spiritual treat teacher, Cynthia Bouget, is that everybody feels so frustrated and what and we feel like what can we do what you know what we can get involved or how, what can we do just every day and she spoke about something called cosmic dialysis which is injecting human consciousness into the planet into the environment into your relationships and it's very easy and I'll share it with you is that, and it's a bit like the Buddhist practice of Tonglen, but not quite as complicated. You just think of some pain in the planet, you inhale it into your human consciousness, and then you just exhale. And you can just exhale, you're exhaling your human consciousness, but because what happens in these times of frustration is people just hold back. They feel frustrated, hopeless. You just breathe out your human consciousness into the atmosphere. You can, you can flavor it with gratitude or love or whatever, but very simple exchange between a human and the planet. So I shared that. So now I'll go into coupling. So um, I did, usually my work follows the female form through myth and culture. And I wouldn't call myself a feminist artist as much as a person preserving the feminine element, which so often gets forgotten or not written about or not um, as observed as what happens in history written by men. Like I had a conversation with Judy Chicago, said, well, female artists get collected by museums and universities, and as soon as that person who acquired the work retires or dies, they throw it away. So a lot of female art, or feminine art, just doesn't get written about, doesn't get collected, you know, it, it, it kind of moves to the background. So I just think of myself as someone who preserves just the images from the past, past and ancient art. So this show, though, is about couples, females and males, or two females, or two males, or best friends, or whatever. And I, I before, like yesterday, I started thinking, well, what really got me to do something about, you know, why did I think about couples? And it's kind of a twofold story. Um, first being, um, I saw this exhibit. I'll start with sandscapes, as you see the sandscapes here. So it was maybe in 2020, went to a museum with my husband where there were sandscapes done by Constantine Navola, who is a, a Sardinian artist who moved to Long Island. If you go to Harvard Science Center, one whole wall is a sandscape done by him. And he also did architectural facades for buildings out of sandscapes. And he did small pieces like this. So, you know, I kept thinking about that 1920, you know, 2020, 21, 22. And finally in 1922, I mean, I started, I brought my notebook because I looked and, um, you know, starting in 1920, I start drawing all these kind of sketches about kind of families or couples, and it was shortly after I had seen the uh, Nivola um, exhibit, which was in Magazzino Italian Art, if you ever go to Cold Springs, New York, it's a fantastic museum. And then one day I just 
said, well, I'm going to Revere Beach. I'm going to get some sand. I came back with a bucket of sand. I built a pit in my studio, and I started making these. Okay, and it became obsessive. The first one I did is the one that is painted there behind Claudia. Um, and I thought, well, what, what, what was that? And then I went way back in my, in my, I think I've always been an artist, okay. So I went way back to when I was playing in sandboxes. And what was going on in my life when I was playing in the sandbox? You know, you're three, four years old. And I said, well, I had this whole fantasy of a family that lived within me. And they weren't like Fred Flint, they weren't cartoons, they weren't stick figures, and they weren't human. But they were this man, he would get up with his briefcase and pull his car out of the garage and leave and wave. And then the two children and a woman were left at home. And I could tune in when I wanted to, to what the father was doing or what the kids were doing. And they were very, you know, very real to me. And so what did they look like? They looked exactly like those ones, I, not the pink things, but the other ones. They looked like that. And I said, gee, you know, this is a seed. You know, sometimes we plant seeds this is a seed that took a long time to really become expressed by me. I mean, surely I painted them in the sandbox when I'm three or four years old, these people who were living inside of me. But then now as a you know, mature artist, I, I made the sandscapes. So the way I made those, you know, I had the Revere Beach sand and a pit, and I kind of pushed the sand away, made a square, and then either drew or pressed different things into the sand, and then took just a teaspoon and plaster and poured them in. And, uh, and I was totally obsessed, you know. I thought of nothing else but making these sandscapes. And that was like maybe last April, and then I packed them all away and uh, went on my summer journey to Italy, came back, um, started making, I don't even know what I started making when I came back. I don't know. But then I went to Italy in December again, and um, I have an ongoing project of chasing down um, images of Vestal Virgins. It's been going on for, I don't know how many years, but um, the story of the Vestal Virgins and the shapes and who has statues of them and what records are there of them and what did they really do and you know every time you mention Vestal Virgins oh yeah they got killed if they had sex and you know but maybe three of them did out of I don't know 500 years it wasn't like a common thing but that's what everybody remembers right oh yeah they killed them um, so all these things were made all these statues were made in, beginning in January 2023, so a lot of hard work, a lot of time, another obsession were these statues, these couplings of people. I was going to exhibit them all together, and um, <clears throat> a friend of mine who's a landscape architect visited my studio and said, oh, no, you can't do that, and she said, it's like a garden. So that's how they got arranged, like a garden rather than as a grouping of couples. And of course, I pulled these out and I said, yeah, I'm going to do a show about coupling and couples. And of course, I got a little, oh, what if people are offended and they think I'm talking about male-female couples? You know, I mean, politically, you know, you have to, this day and age, not do anything that's going to get you in trouble. Like, oh, she's only... Well, my gay friend said, well, what do you, as soon as I said, I'm doing a show about couples, well, what are you going to do about gay people? I mean, that was the first question. And, you know, I thought, oh, I, don't, I certainly don't want to offend anybody, you know. So this is about the beloved coupling that we all yearn for, you know, whether it's the beloved relationship of a best friend, of a partner, of a lover. We, no matter what, we all long for beloved partnerships. Um, and then, of course, I wrote the book about my uh, grandparents, uh, Bridge of Love, in, I think I wrote that during COVID, but um, 
which is also a story about coupling and um, their correspondence in 1919, 1920, and immigration, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that fit into uh, my thinking about coupling as well. Um, and of course, then I invited Nick Nixon, who in his luscious photos of uh, coupling, I, and he said, sure, sure. And um, this originally was an artist I met when I was at the American Academy in Rome, and I was going to put it behind my, uh, my uh, guardians of sacred couplings. These are guardians of sa sacred couplings, but it just really didn't work, but it looks... I went, I'll be right back. I just want to get something. from uh, just, so this is a, a, a Venetian artist who studied a, a, a version of the same Carta Pesta work that I do. And, and it's something you can hang on a doorknob or uh, hang from anywhere, but it's the same material I use, a little thing. And I thought, whoa, I can make those, something like that. And so those are torsos. Um, which I created a form and then put the paper that these are made up over it and painted it. And I added a, uh, as you can see, they all have uh, a, uh, uh, a crystal navel because all coupling, all human beings come attached to a navel. So it's kind of a, a combination here of very present day influence like going to Venice and finding this, and the sandscape from like that I was playing with when I was three or four years old, uh, coming all together. And I think that is happens to a lot of artists. You know, we have a lot of unconscious, subconscious stuff going on, and sometimes you don't understand exactly where it comes from until you really stop and start digging through the layers of the onion. Why is it that I did that, you know? And I did figure out why I did those and why, you know, I had that, that family living within me when I was playing in the sandbox and probably was drawing them when I was three years old. So, um, and each of these couplings of statues for me uh, have a relationship. For instance, the ones back there by Augusta are Kanai Sensei and Dasa Oppenheimer, a Naikido teacher and a yoga teacher. Right by my husband's elbow is Chrissy and Matt, us. Okay. Uh, this is my daughter and sister, my grandmothers, my aunts, my first friend who played in the sandbox with me, Janie, and Susan, my friend now. Uh, so everybody has a relationship uh, to each other and to the world and uh, a reason to be together and in their coupling. So any questions? These are all made out of paper, which um, if ever since I've been here at Galatea, I made the masks and the vessels and the vestal plates, everything. I use the same material over and over and over. And uh, it's paper that you can only buy in Lecce, Italy. In where? Lecce, Italy, southern Italy, south Italy, because of, um, they have a tradition of making religious statuary. Um, they're a part of Italy that has no marble, only soft stone, and they were very poor, so they could never import marble. And so they developed a way to make religious statuary out of paper, such as this, which they then impregnate with eight layers of plaster and rabbit hide skin glue, and then paint. And it looks just like, you know, you wouldn't know that it was paper. So, Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about the process of making those? Because when I came in, I thought they were clay, and then yeah. I thought they were wood. 
And then I have to admit, you can edit, I touched them, and then I realized <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're light, you know, you can... Um, so, I, it's, 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 it's interesting, I usually, you know, I like printmaking, I like painting and stand where you kind of reverse everything, you know, you're working backwards. Um, and I, I, if any of you have seen my torsos uh, where I work inside a mold, I, I make a mold and I work inside. Well, this is a little different because I built a sculpture I built like three of them, and then I worked on the outside, and then I had to cut it, and it was like giving birth, believe me, it wasn't easy, to pull that thing out of the paper shell. I mean, it was like, you know, using my feet and yanking, and, you know, it was like giving birth. And then, um, and then I had to reseal it, um, and that's how I do it. And, you know, making the face and the expressions were just uh, fingers, you know, finger pressing and different, uh, yeah, just using my finger and pressing different places while the paper is still moist. Now, the paper has no glue in it. You know, it, it's all fiber. That's why it, 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 it absorbs the hardening agent. How long does it take to dry completely? To dry. Um, well, again, it was a humid summer. Mm -hmm. So on those humid, day, humid days, you know, I was somewhat, you know, you don't want like mold or some sort of weird things to start growing in it. I had to be very careful about those humid days. Um, so on the humid days, I think, I don't think I ever brought them home, but you know, I just had to constantly have fans. So they take, a, they take time to, I mean, there's many, many steps. First building the inside, then, you know, then making the outside, then giving, you know, yanking the mold out, and then sealing the mold, and then, of course, uh, finishing the bottoms, et cetera, et cetera. So many, many steps that I don't make one and finish one because it's a series of days. And I think the whole, you know, I studied with these Cartapesta masters and everything is very ritualistic. And I kind of follow the ritualistic, eight layers of paper, <laughs> eight layers of glue, you know. And I don't know why there's eight layers. I don't know why, of, you know, I don't know why, but that's what they do, that's what they taught me, that's what I do, so. Yes. I just wanted to say how much I admire your ability to take an idea from all these different media, mm -hmm. which I know is not an easy thing for many artists. Um, like I'm a painter and I can't think the way you do, and it's just, it's wonderful. So it's not a question. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I do, I do tend to think three-dimensionally. That's what is, delights me, you know, the dimensions of things. So. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, I know how to paint, but it doesn't delight me quite the same way as building something that takes up space. And I think that's something my husband and I have in common. He's a construction engineer, so he builds buildings. You know, we both are dealing with space in, in a certain way that is common. Yes. Augusta. So, Premier travels in Italy. Did the puppets come out of there at all? I mean, you mean these, yeah, these, like, um... Were there Italian puppet traditions that... You mean these couple therapy ones? Yeah. Oh. I don't know, you know, I haven't, you know, I thought about like where the sandscapes came from. I haven't really t thought about where the puppets have come from. I think that it goes back to way, way back in childhood. I don't know how many people here played with paper dolls. I could spend every day, sit, I had this little table, it had a drawer, in the drawer were crayons, in this drawer were scissors, and I could sit there and 
you know, just create stories about all these paper dolls that I made and their clothes and, you know, where they went and blah, 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 you know, just a lot of stories about paper dolls and that, that probably came from that. Yeah. Yes? A question on the construction. Do you make a pulp on the paper? No. Strip? No. Strips? strips. Huh. Yeah, it's not pulps. Um, usually plastic, and I don't know if you remember the cats I made, you know, that's all paper and then wrapped with tape and then clay added and, you know, whatever, whatever I find to make a mold. You know, it, 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 and some of them I just build onto a mold that I started and, you know, maybe use it five, six times. Yeah. Having work helps a little bit this, you know, put, putting something. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. One day I had like, some illness and I called my husband and son, not son, my daughter and husband to come and finish because you have to do it all in one day. You have to make one in one day. You can't let it dry and add to it because the, the enemy of this is air an air bubble, an air anything, you know, or getting air between these eight layers. So they came and they finished. Yeah, so it's you kind know. of a rough mm -hmm. finish. Really. The what? A rough, rough work, like the larger strips of paper, and then you start doing the smaller. Right. Ones. The last layer has more patterning on it than okay. the interior layers. Yeah. And you said you, um, you arrived at a when I was a child, probably because I had those people living inside me, you know, <laughs> the man who went off to work and the, the, the house and everything, you know, they were just a part of my childhood imagination that played out in the sandbox and later probably with the paper dolls and you know, I like telling stories. You know, you all know that, you know, I've written the novel and taught writing for 13 years because of the stories. I have a lot of stories in my head as they play out here, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Any well, other questions? I, I love how you mentioned the ritual because when I first started to walk through, that's exactly what I thought about I was trying to identify exactly what it means to me first of course but I did sense a ritual component uh, I love the way you carefully curated every single aspect yes I of did the space. <laughs> everything there is a meaning there is something it's very well explored I love the details I love the messages I love the chocolate I love the fact that I looked at the art school piece. I love the fact that I came in person because the pictures do not. It's hard to take <laughs> pictures of 3D. Yes, yes. I mean, it was, I, I, I always say that, you know, of course you can see, you can read, but there's nothing like seeing something like this in person. Really, this is an incredible, well curated spot. You know, the chairs, every single detail. You could spend hours here in, fantasize about so many things and the wall pieces also are so uh, playful because if you don't read the labels they could be gesso they could be stone carved they could be paper they could be anything yeah so it's a I, I love the way you curated the, the well, entire thank you. space and I made the chairs to hide the uh, machines behind them <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, a, just a quick, I, I don't want to move them. I won't, of course. But you want the relationship to change just by changing one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whether they're looking at each yeah. other or like a not. Chance, a chance are they talking to each other? Are they talking about each other? Yeah, it's a lot of fun to, uh, I mean, I, in my studio, I played with them a lot, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because they're they're side by side. They're not looking at each other. Uh, some of them were. I mean, these. Some of them were. Yeah. Some of them were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
So when are you building a, a, a life-size chessboard? <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. And I have some matches here. If anybody smokes, whether you smoke cigarettes or whatever, please take some. <laughs> because, you know, they're here, and I think Carolyn didn't know what to do with them. You can leave with one. Well, you know, if we, if, if anybody wants the yoga workshop, sure. I mean, I teach yoga and I and I do art full time, so I don't do yoga. I'll teach yoga full time, but uh. sign me up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you.